Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lights on Data show. Today, we're going to go inside the tech giants, analytics, AI, and bootstrapping success. Our wonderful guest today is Kirsten Lum. She is the CPO at Storytellers.ai. She oversees all aspects of data science, product, and engineering, including the development of AI and ML systems across diverse industries. At Amazon and Expedia, she led dozens of leaders across engineering, applied science, economics, business intelligence, instrumentation, and data architecture at global scale. Kirsten directly managed and led one of the Jeff Wilkes core science and economics teams at Amazon, where she was selected for Amazon's top tier leadership program. Wow. 500 out of around a million and 500,000 people worldwide selected each year. She graduated from the University of Washington with distinction and now teaches at their Master's of Business Analytics degree program. Wow, that's very impressive. Welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here this morning. So before we go into our questions for today, could you share a hobby or a fun fact about yourself? Yes. So I will talk a little bit about my hobby, which goes into my fun fact, which actually is probably a bridge into the story that we'll go into in the next <laughs> messages. I really love writing. I and in particular, I'm I love the genre of like fantasy or science fiction for kids in like middle school. That's my absolute favorite genre wow. to read and my favorite genre to write. And part of that is because that time period in my life when I was reading books at that time was really formative to me of like figuring out like what I believed and what I liked and didn't like and how life can be an adventure and like that. So I just love the thought of being able to write something to inspire kids to be like, oh yes, there's like this adventure waiting for me on the other side of this long schooling process that I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Do you have a favorite story that you wrote? That I wrote? So I, Do you publish I, them I, as well? It's not, I haven't published anything <clears throat> in the process of writing one that I really love, but I have to keep it secret for now, but I will share <gasps> some of the things that I like reading, <laughs> which might give you a vibe of what I like to write, which I really love. Like The Giver is such a good book. I love that book. And actually the movie ended up being really good too. Of course, like Chronicles of Narnia is one of my absolute favorites. Just that very, like that heroes and doing good and being strong and brave like the story just like, like get me going so that's my vibe love it that's a very interesting side of yourself <laughs> it's great to to get into fiction i i recently got into it a few years ago and it, it really changed uh, my life all right so let's uh, go into our topic for the day. You've uh, had a remarkable career, um, Kirsten, including roles at Amazon and Expedia. Uh, can you share some key takeaways from your time at these tech giants, especially in terms of analytics and data management practice that can be uh, applied to businesses across different verticals? Yeah. I would say one of my key takeaways from my time working at these very large companies is that while it might feel like, you know, a big company like Amazon or Expedia would have things all figured out, that's not usually the case. <laughs> so like the, one of my key takeaways is that like the data field is all evolving consistently and pretty much everyone struggles to do it really well. So if you're a, going into the data field, or B, you are a user of data, you're interfacing with a data team, or you're using data, you're a business owner that's trying to figure out how to use data. And you're like, gosh, this is like hard, and I cannot find frameworks and steps and processes that are repeatable. It's not like you're not missing something. It's this is actually a very difficult field and one that I think is lacking some really foundational, what people would call best practices or frameworks or ways of thinking about like, here's how I instrument, here's how I take that instrumentation and turn it into analytics. And here's how I use analytics to actually make decisions. Even at these very large companies, they still are iterating on what that framework looks like for themselves. So that I, I think would be the key takeaway because it's in two ways. One, you don't have to worry about that imposter syndrome. That's like, gosh, everyone knows something that I don't know. Nope, <laughs> like they don't actually like, and then two, it's also an encouragement that like, 
the just a few steps into building a framework around instrumentation analytics and decision making with data can be like these very transformative things. And I guess, yeah, everything is evolving. So things are always changing and things are always new, even for more mature organizations in their, yeah. in their data space too. And That's true. That, that makes sense. So what about then uh, transitioning from the corporate role to then founding your own company, Storytellers.ai? It, how, how did that go about? Yeah. The, there was this moment when I was working at, I was working at Amazon and the way that the Amazon works is interesting. So you may have heard this, but it's, I, I can say from the inside, it's very true. Amazon's kind of unique in that, unlike a lot of our organizations that you're like working in one big company, Amazon really operates like a whole bunch of startups all stuck together with a lot of technology and tooling kind of connective tissue between them. And so my role is I was in what you would call like central Amazon. I kind of call it like the mothership is how I dub it. So there's like prime, like that's a kind of its own <laughs> business, like within this larger business, it's the organizational structures, they have their own team. And then there's music and there's video and there's devices and there's all, and all these tiny ones that they're testing with. But I was in what we'd call like central Amazon. So I wasn't actually affiliated with one of those businesses. I was looking from like across all of them at like from a customer perspective. So what's the customer's experience of interacting with Amazon so that we can differentiate? Here's how our organization is structured, but actually to a consumer, this is one company. It actually is one company, even if internally we have these ways of working that's a little different. And as I was doing that, I got the opportunity to look at actually lots of different little tiny mini businesses, sometimes really big businesses, <laughs> and see how one, all of them had similar problems with data. What data do I need to collect? How do I get that data into a place where I can make decisions with it? And how do I make decisions with data? And then beyond that, how do I then use advanced decision making, like predictive analytics, forecasting, or these other technologies that are even farther, harder to get a skill set in. And I was seeing how one, all of them needed this. They needed guidance. They needed hands-on help. And two, they all tended to have this pattern of once they started that flywheel, I could see this benefit. They right. were being able to test things about how their product worked to try and better serve the customer, which then improved their business and became this flywheel of like, okay, I better understand my customer. Now I better understand what my product needs to be. And then I launch it and then I better understand my customer, right? Like so they were seeing this flywheel. And I was like, this is so transformative to all of these organizations in this huge company that just mops up data scientists mm -hmm. and like economists and software engineers, like just mops them all up. Like, There's gotta be thousands and thousands of organizations out there in that same boat that don't have the resources to pay a data scientist, like, like a, just one data scientist, let alone someone like me that leads data scientists and can help the data scientists translate between the data science team and the business team that's trying to make decisions. Like it's just gotta be out of reach for most of them. There's, there's not a lot of them and they're expensive. And so with that was the thought I was having was I was seeing this pattern. And so I was like, that's got to be a company, right? Like, that's got to be a company you could have to go work with these organizations that are we consider them traditionally underserved by data disciplines and say, if you don't have a data warehouse, all good. We'll help you like with that journey. And by the way, used to be that would take you two years, should not take you two years. So if you're getting consultants mm -hmm. telling you it's going to be a two-year long project, should not take that long these days. Or, okay, we've got a data warehouse. We've got data coming in. We don't know what to do with it. Okay, let's take a look at what data you have. Let's make a plan for what you could do to use data in your decision making. And then especially, how can we take that data and not just let humans review it, but actually integrate the data back into your systems through things like predictive analytics to start making your systems automatically make the decisions you want them to make. And that way you get so much leverage from that information that you're gathering. So that was the, the seed of this idea. And my husband, who is the CEO of our company, so we are, I, it's like we're a husband and wife team in this company as well. He's also led like software engineers and he worked in marketplace at Amazon. So onboarding third-party sellers. And he like took this bet that like this, there's a market for this. And we've really seen that to be the case. And it's just been so great to see, have this hypothesis and be like, 
see it play out in real life. There are companies out there that are like, yes, I need help. And yes, I'm seeing the transformation that happens when you use data in decision making in this way. That, that's incredible. And now you've grown it to almost 5 million in revenue. Yeah. So that's incredible. And we have a question here, which um, I think a lot of people are wondering yeah. from Masa. And she's wondering why do most people working for big companies leave to run their businesses? especially one that would work for Amazon. So I think when you uncover that, there may be like two types of people. One that uh, kind of sees that opportunity and they're thinking, okay, well, maybe that can also be improved within the company that I can work at. And others feel like you and your husband that maybe have that entrepreneurship bug as well. They're thinking, how can we start something on our own and help other companies and turn this into a product, turn this into a business? Yeah. yeah. However, I am wondering... Did you both quit at the same time? Was it a step-by-step -step process? Was it more of a sequential approach or was it a, an all or nothing? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> question. Yeah, and I'll answer, I'll answer both in like a, in maybe in like one or maybe it'll be two. So I think in particular, I'll talk a little bit about what the journey was like, especially because it's when it's a husband and wife team, right? Like if you're two people in two different families <laughs> you increase the what is the is the right word like the surface area of risk becomes smaller right because you're not putting it all in one family so to your point like we did take when you actually started the company first with this idea and started proving it out with different companies <clears throat> and then i'm consulting on doing understanding how to actually do this from a data science perspective and then as we saw this idea take off, that's when I ended up leaving Amazon after my second was born. So I have two little girls. And after my second daughter was born, that's when I left Amazon. And so it was this process. We, we mentioned that we're bootstrapped, so, which means that we didn't take any VC funding to build the technology that we use for doing our work. And so we did try and distribute the risk of that over time. And I think that really gets to that question of like, how do you decide whether to leave this role at a bigger company and start your own thing or not. And I think for, at least for our journey, what I would say is that it is like a dream job for a lot of people to work in those companies. And also there are, there is a particular way of working that sort of enforces. So when yeah. you're working at a huge company, we talk about like levers that you have to pull to change what's happening in your job. And you have certain levers and for, and I had some really big levers to be like, I got to choose a lot of things, but like, how is this team composed? How do we work? How is, what is our workflow? I got a lot of leverage and a, a lot of latitude to make that kind of decision. But at the end of the day, it's such a big shift that if you're wanting to change, not just how your team is working, but like how the discipline operates, mm -hmm. sometimes you can do that. And sometimes you can't. <laughs> personally, actually, this particular thing, I'll talk a little bit about this, the way that we work and why this formula that we found like works for these organizations is that we can build machine learning models radically faster than almost any other data scientist I've met. And I talked to a lot of data scientists and I, I actually did a Twitter poll. I was like, how many machine learning models would you feel like you were expected to build if you're working for like an enterprise company like Amazon? And it was something like 75% of people said somewhere between one and three. And that is, and you think about a small business and how much you'd have to pay a data scientist and how yeah. much the return would be on one machine learning model, yeah. that math does not work. So in order for data science, especially machine learning to work for small organizations, you actually have to increase your throughput by orders of magnitude because they're smaller companies. So even if you got, even if you got a huge like lift on whatever the revenue metric is or whatever, that still is not a huge number because they're a small company, it's a small base. So you have to think about like every model, if it could get a little bit of lift, you need to have a lot of them and you need to do them all at once in order to make it work. And so that's mm -hmm. what I was trying to develop. And honestly, I got a lot of pushback from, I, I, and I still get a lot of pushback from other data scientists in the field saying, it's not possible. The way that we, we talk about it is like, can you abstract the data science workflow from the physical data that you're doing the data science on, particularly machine learning? Can you abstract developing machine learning model from the data in which it's the, that it's being trained? And a many, almost every data scientist you ask will say no. They'll say every machine learning model has to be unique and custom to the data that it's trained on. And 
it, but this is my hypothesis that we've proved out here is that mm -hmm. there is an abstraction. You can actually say, actually, there's patterns there and you can make that model building process so much faster mm -hmm. if you abstract away and find those patterns and find those leverage points, you can actually make this benefit. So that's my, that was why I decided to leave Amazon. It's like, I couldn't do that. I didn't feel like I could get that, really get that hypothesis tested in an organization where building that it, to them, it's like, yeah, I can pay a data scientist that much money to build three models. And is it really that much beneficial to me to like change that the way I do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where it really comes down to. Can you actually get that seed of your idea tested in that organization? Sometimes you can. Amazon tests a whole bunch of really cool things that are like employees come up with and like, yeah, write a PRFQ and run with it, right? They do that a lot. But my particular one, I was like, I need to do this. <laughs> the other way, yeah. Makes sense. And I do encourage people to uh, follow you on Twitter as well at uh, Maxi, M A C H S C I or x.com, I guess, now. <laughs> Still not used to it, yeah. But yeah, uh, check you out there and the content that you post, and uh, maybe they'll even find the poll that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. When you uh, chat, when, when you when I was listening to you, uh, Kate Srachny came to mind. <clears throat> she also has two daughters, and she had a similar journey. She left a very big consulting company, and now she's on her own, and she's doing amazing. She... No, she's, she's the founder of Data Key. Data. <laughs> anyway, she's uh, listening here, and uh, she was wondering... Yeah. Kirsten, what's your favorite part of your role as storytellers.ai? Oh, great question. Can I have two favorites? Is that all right if I do two favorites? Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> my two favorite parts. There's one, one part of my role, my favorite part of my role that's external facing and one part of my role that's my favorite that's internal facing. So my external facing favorite part of my role is encountering organizations that feel like data is impossible. Like it's impossible to like, it's, we're a nonprofit. How could we possibly use predictive analytics, right? Like we don't have, we obviously don't have enough data. We don't have enough expertise. And it feels like there's so many barriers to like using data in this way. And my favorite thing about that part is breaking down how data science is used to improve an organization and helping them to see, oh, actually I'm only a couple steps away. I've got to put some work in, especially the one of the hardest parts is I've got to change how I do my work, which is honestly, it's really hard for a lot of organizations to change their workflows and their ways of working and to integrate a new tool into their decision-making process that's hard. But if they can do that, if they can say, yeah, where I used to just do this randomly or whatever was top of my queue or whatever, I'm actually going to go look at this data point and I'm going to use that to help me decide what to do at this point. And I'm going to understand that data point is encoding all of my judgment that I've been using mm -hmm. until this point is mm -hmm. coded into that. And it's helping me to make my judgments, make my decisions in a more consistent way with the best decisions I made in the past. Like when people can get their mind around that, I just like, they're, they just like, it's like opens a whole frontier, right? Like, and so that's one of my favorite parts. And so I just call that like my, the side of just like education and like talking about data and like how it can be used and coming up with the plans, like A-B tests and that kind of thing. Just absolutely love that part of my job. And then the second part of my job that I love is more internal facing. And I touched on it a little bit, but it's this constantly pushing the boundary of how long we think it must take and how many human hours it must take to develop a performant machine learning model. Hmm. And like looking, I love it. It's, it's reminding me of something. It's like on the tip of my tongue. It's reminding me of something. When someone like tells you like, oh, that can't be done. Like human flight, right? Like people are just like, humans are never going to fly. Like you're never going to build a machine that can fly a human. And then for some people, it was just like, yes, I will. Yes, I will. And then can you imagine like that first time? It's like, <gasps> and so that's happened. That happens for us where it's like all of these people that are incredibly smart and that I respect a ton and have done a ton of data science. They'll be like, sorry, like, you can't just block. And then you go and you do it and you're like, holy smoke, I love that. And it's, it might sound a little bit like contrarian almost, but honestly, one of my favorite parts is then to go to those people who are like, that's not possible. And be like, I did it. 
And then mm -hmm. they see it and they're like, oh, what does that mean for everything else we do? That is so cool like, to just push the boundary and the boundary that we're pushing is making our work more applicable to more people. It's just like, yeah, that, I love that part so much. It's oh, I bet. Yeah, I could already like, feel the yeah, endorphins, yeah. you know, <laughs> do, filling me up when you're sharing the story. <laughs> so, so basically, you like aha moments, yes? Wow. Like seeing the aha moments <laughs> on people's faces, both internally and externally. That's I why that. my the motto of my business or the tagline is I live in the aha moment the moment of realization yes. so it's very nice that you are able to to produce that for other people mm -hmm. i have a very short question who which are the people that you talk to from organizations or from your clients what are their job titles yeah they're the level so we, i actually mm -hmm. scan the whole gamut and part of this i'll talk about one of these principles and there's a great pod a podcast episode from if you're familiar with michael lewis who wrote moneyball right yeah yes he wrote my okay <laughs> Like, oh goodness. <laughs> okay, so he wrote my book. He has a podcast called Against the Rules, which is a great podcast. I love that podcast. And he has one particular episode, which is called Six Levels Down. And so I'll I'm gonna come back to that podcast, but I'll talk about first about the job titles. I talk all the way from like CEOs, CTOs, VPs of IT, that like C suite. And then I actually work in my day-to-day -day all the way down to a customer service representative that's deciding how to make calls to their leads. So we'd span that whole gamut. And the reason for that is oftentimes the line level leader has a firsthand understanding of what the problems are in their organization. And the CEO or the CTO or the VP of IT has a really like bird's eye view of where the business needs to go in order for it to work. So like that tends to be like, there's benefits to both of those vantage points, but they don't tend to live in one person, unless you're a founder, <laughs> see this live in one person. But in any size organization that gets relatively large, you end up distributing that responsibility of having those vantage points. VP or a CEO has the responsibility to understand how the organization in total is working and its input and output relationships and what needs to be true in order for the organization to work. And then the frontline person needs to know what are the problems my customer has and what are my barriers to serving the customer in the way that we that is in keeping with how this company should work. And that podcast I mentioned, the Michael Lewis podcast, Six Levels Down, he talks about this example of when they were making the website for the U.S., when the U.S. built the website for the single-payer insurance. So government built this marketplace for single payers to, be, to get insurance. And how it, like, it just, like, blew up when they released it, right? Like, it was impossible for people to get in. It was, like, there was, it was, the site was basically crashed because there were so many people on it. And they had to go down six layers down in order to find the person who understand what was going wrong in order mm -hmm. to fix it. And he gives this other example of is again in the insurance space of a company that wanted to change the way healthcare worked. And they thought it would be a matter of like, where are our clinics located and what kind of doctors are we getting and how are we marketing it? And like, they thought in those terms, but actually the, one of the hardest problems they had was how to bill insurance. Because the, all the rules in the U.S. for how you bill insurance for something you've done are esoteric, completely esoteric. So they ended up, their startup went from building all these clinics to actually building technology for properly billing insurance and what the rules are. And the way they found those rules is they hired someone who wasn't a, a biller, a medical biller in a like a big hospital. And she'd been doing it forever and was like, she would come in. And they would try and make a proper bill. And then she would look at it and be like, this is wrong. Like you're doing all these things wrong. She'd like mark it up and then go back to the engineering team and they would like recode it. And like they it took them years of back and forth with this one woman wow. who like had just been doing this forever and just knew. And, and that was, and then here, there's a punchline to that. I really encourage you to listen to it because I, I can't ruin the punchline because it's too good. <laughs> there was a punchline to that story that will just absolutely, you'll just like it. it I was laughing out loud when I heard the punchline. <laughs> but that principle is so true. So that's why when I think about who I work with, I absolutely will, as the CTO of our company, interface with executives. But eventually, in order to make sure that what we're building to help make their business work the way it should, eventually I do need to talk to 
the individual customer service representative or the individual marketer or the other person who's on the front line actually making those Makes day-to-day sense. decisions. No, thank you for sharing that. And as a follow-up, we have a comment here from uh, T. Scotland, Daniel, who's actually a famous uh, chief data scientist. He does uh, consulting and training in the data science space, but uh, he's mentioning that I, I learned a secret from consulting and Kirsten just referenced. Clients need to believe that success is possible. So providing them with that confidence really helps them uh, actually achieve it. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. So it, it makes sense that you you start at that top level. You're okay, this is what we can do for you. They believe it, they buy into it, and then you get on to work and right. help their lives. Yeah. What advice would you give then for becoming data scientist, especially now that storytellers that AI is in the space? And I think it's fair to say that it's really revolutionizing the industry. What, what, yeah, what advice would you offer to aspiring data scientists? Yeah. I'll bucket it into three different, three different types of aspirations. So I'll start actually with the very beginning of that funnel. It's someone who's not a data scientist that wants to become a data scientist. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know about that part of this journey pretty, pretty closely because I actually started out (laughs) my degree. I'm in in English literature, going back to my fun fact about myself, my degree (laughs) was in English literature. So I was not like CS major. I don't have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. I don't, from an educational standpoint, have those signals that a lot of people have. And I came to data science actually as a marketer. So my, after I did, graduated my English degree, my first job is I did marketing at a startup. And I was doing SEO back in like the mid 2010s, which was like, that's like the golden age of SEO. And what I was finding was that when I had the data to understand how my actions as a marketer impacted the outcomes I was trying to drive, it helped me to make decisions about where I spent my time much more efficiently. Mm-hmm. And that literally at the first time I had encountered using data to do decision-making in that structured way was at that startup. So that moment was when I saw the power of this lever. And so if you're in that space where you're like, I see this. I actually like that part of my job a lot. Like I'm a marketer, but the part of my job that I like a lot is waking up in the morning with my cup of coffee and opening my Tableau dashboard and looking at, oh, that A-B tested really well. Wow. Might be an aspiring data scientist. (laughs) And for folks that are in that place, my biggest piece of advice is it looks more unapproachable than it is. It looks like you think about someone who is a machine learning engineer. You're like, I'd eventually like to be able to get there, but it seems like it'll take forever. Mm. And it does take a while, but it's a step at a time. And those steps are much more achievable than they appear on the outset. Take it from someone who got a liberal arts degree and eventually now is working in a highly technical field. It's like just a step at a time. And the place that I usually recommend starting those steps is there's three kind of major technology buckets that I say, like, just get into it and start playing around. Knowing, choosing a cloud platform. Like, number one, if you're going to be an AWS person, AWS is a good place to start because a lot of people use AWS. So AWS is fine. Just choose AWS. I like GCP. I work in GCP a lot, Google Cloud Platform, because they have a lot of like integrations with with sort of the AI and ML world. I tend to find mm-hmm. I like their tools for AI and ML better. So I'm a GCP person. I picked up GCP. Also, some people pick up Azure. That's becoming more common. But like, pick one of those three and just start like how, and these are the questions. How do I get, how do I get some data? <laughs> like, what is, where can I go get a data set? Any kind of data set. Kaggle's a good place. GCP has a data marketplace. Get that data into a storage location. That's going to be your relational storage, Redshift, BigQuery, for instance, and start trying to manipulate it. Like writing SQL is a good place to start. SQL Mm -hmm. or those two. Mm -hmm. And all those environments will have all the tools you need to just go get a data set, put it in there and start manipulating. That's the absolute first step. And once you've done that a little bit, it will snowball so fast. Like how quickly when you see the little win, you say, oh, and then I could do this. And then you figure out how to do it. And oh, and then I could do this. And it snowballs. So that's my big thing is just 
it seems so intimidating to just go dive into a cloud platform and like put a data set in there and like start touching it and moving it. Yeah. But that's, try it. You'll be surprised. It'll be, and be prepared that you might get sucked in at that point. <laughs> 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 yeah. So that's my advice for really aspiring. And then I have some other advice that I usually take for people. Okay. Imagine you're like in a, the data field and you're like, I'm a BI and I want to become a machine learning engineer. Like you're trying to figure out how the steps to go from, I'm an analyst, but I want to be way more technical. It's a flavor of the same, the same thing, except I really recommend taking on responsibility as part of that. And thinking about the responsibilities that you take on in the role that you're in mm -hmm. and pointing it towards that place you want to go. And the way that you can figure that out is if you go read like 10 job descriptions for the job you want to eventually have and make note of the skills and tasks that job requires. It seems super basic, right? Like it seems like too obvious, but really that's the best artifact you have for understanding what it takes to be that thing you want to be. Great and advice. That I do that even for, oh, what would it take to be a, whatever, this company, a thing at open AI, what would it take to be a research scientist at open AI? Go read their, read their job descriptions and like, okay, that's what I would need to do. It's a checklist. And then in your current role, you could do this. Even if you're still a marketer, I want to be a data scientist. Okay. In your current role as a marketer, what are some responsibilities you can take on? that points you towards that data science role. Mm -hmm. you probably need to take ownership of some sort of Excel spreadsheet that's going around, right? <laughs> whatever Excel spreadsheet <laughs> your team is using to manage whatever. Okay, you want to try and ask for that job. And then just take on those. Don't think of it taking on a new job. Take, thinking of it as taking on a responsibility or a task. Yes. And then those snowball. And then for folks that are like really deep in their career and like, how do I go from, okay, I'm a principal data scientist and I want to set my sights higher. I always encourage at that point to start questioning your assumptions about how your job works, because those assumptions, if you can break those assumptions, especially, you know, back to my story about, you know, this paradigm of, oh, it just takes four months to build a machine learning model. Start questioning those things because that's where you start to actually make an impact on your discipline. Mm -hmm. And the, that's the key is like, what does everyone believe? And is it necessary that would should be true? And if it's not, and you can prove that it's not, that's the kind of stuff that people are like, holy smokes, like it's so useful that you like change the way that we thought about this piece. So <laughs> question your assumptions is probably my biggest advice for I love that. But sometimes the opposite also happens, right? That you're overly optimistic that, mm -hmm. oh no, this will be done in one month and uh, you're proven wrong a couple times. And then you're like, yeah. oh, okay, I guess that's how it is. Not knowing of storyteller study, yeah. Yeah, it, that's an interesting one to me because that like scope because it's like a scoping problem, right? Like it's like, mm -hmm. and here's what is so critical. As goes, I was a PM also for a while, so you've just touched on my PM. Oh, my PM <laughs> part of me stood up <laughs> like I have a thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that I find it's really rare for people to understand why that happened. Mm. Like to actually inspect, like, why did I think it was going to take one month? If I break this really? task down, why did I think it was going to take one month? Is it because I thought the project was going to be scope A, but it ended up as scope A plus B and I didn't scope the B part. And so, so that's like a definitional problem. And then if it's like, if there's a task in there, like this particular task of like getting access to data, I thought was going to be like, I'll go talk to someone and they'll get me access that day. And actually, and it ended up taking three weeks and a VP approval to get access yeah. to that data. And that's like a process question is, does that process need to work that way? Like, how could we change the way that we get access to data, store data and grant yeah. access to data yeah. such that it is a day, it's just a day task. And like that questioning of assumptions, should it have taken three weeks for me to get that data? And like, what would need to be true in order for it to take one day? That flywheel turns super fast. Once you start having that mindset, thinking of it less in terms of like success and failure, and more in terms of hypothesis testing. My hypothesis is this will take one month. My hypothesis was false. Let me inspect that why my hypothesis was false and unpack that and see what's there that has like, something for me to grab onto and change. That's huge. I love working with people like that, that always are constantly like, oh, what is this is how we want it to work? Like, should it work a little differently? <laughs> okay. I, I, so I'm on a day-to-day -day basis, I work in data governance and I find that very often that you're trying to get the, to the root cause of why something is happening 
you think you've nailed it. So you go down that direction. And along the way, you're finding all these different other areas that are like, okay, I need to focus there and improve that. I need to focus there and touch on that and see how that can be changed. But it's so fun and rewarding in the end, if you get to have an impact on that status quo and getting that improvement. So Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Data governance is like a hats off to y'all. It is one of the thankless jobs. I feel like it's like so hard to, like, it's one of those jobs that it's so hard to bring visibility to. And it is so necessary that like anytime I meet someone at Data Governance, I'm like, thank you for your service. <laughs> oh, I so appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, George it's all, all a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> so what about, okay, so that's great advice for data scientists. What about to entrepreneurs or people aspiring. that want to aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah, man. I think entrepreneurship is, it's almost like in, I put it in a class of like giving people advice on when to get married, right? <laughs> like so many factors that are so personal to that person. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if you look at it in the macro, there's so much of it that I want to encourage, right? I think marriage is great and I love marriage and I love when people get married. And also it's like, wow, there's so many factors that go into when you decide to actually get married to a particular person, which is, I feel like the analogy for entrepreneurship is like entrepreneurship is hard, but also amazing. And there's so many factors that go into deciding, is this the idea that you go all in? for as an entrepreneur. And one of the things that I really encourage is to think about, to hold the idea of what you want to build as an entrepreneur loosely and always be checking if your idea is actually resonating with anyone. Mm -hmm. And that means, and I'm sure this is like maybe the top advice that, that people give is like, you just have to ship as fast as you can. You right. need to get the seed of the idea in front of other people as quickly as you can to start to see if there's anything there. And then there's going to be this band of like, for a little bit, maybe they say, no, there's nothing in nothing there. And I still think there's something here. So I'm going to iterate on this idea and improve it and come back to these people and see if it starts to resonate and get traction. And then knowing when you have checked that idea thoroughly enough to say, you know what, this isn't something people are looking for. <laughs> you know, So like <laughs> that is, I feel like mm -hmm. if you can have the critical distance from your idea, love entrepreneurship and think of your idea as an example of entrepreneurship and say, I want to keep iterating on these ideas and taking them where people are going to respond. That's the number one thing. And we were fortunate enough that the idea we had traction with people right away, there were people who wanted this as a service. And then there are other parts of how we operate that didn't get traction. And we had to change how we worked and we had to build around. I thought, it, I thought that working with small organizations was going to look like this, but actually that doesn't work for them. And if we work that way, that's not going to meet their needs. So actually we need to do it this other way and being willing to see the flaws and work to change them and work the way that it needs to work, not how you want it to work. That I think is one of the hardest things to keep an eye on as an entrepreneur. Amazing yeah. advice. I love how T. Scott and Daniel summarize Kirsten's energy. Kirsten, Lam, your expertise and professional presence are really impressive. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. I love it. Oh, so Absolutely. kind. And you're such a great storyteller as well, and you have such an inspiring story. Thanks for being on the Lights and Data show and putting the lights on the analytics, the AI entrepreneurship. And we're looking forward to following your journey and seeing what's next for storytellers.ai. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. I do recommend people to follow uh, Kirsten Lum on, on LinkedIn. Of course, check out storytellers.ai. And as we mentioned before, also check out her Twitter on M-A-C-H-S-C-I. <laughs> or <Nice>. X.com. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Kirsten. It was lovely to have you on the show. Thank you. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. You Thank too. you. You too.